hi everybody thanks for coming today and thank you ellie um and clifford and hibiscus um center for inviting me to speak um so yeah just to quickly go over um what i've done uh, previously um i'm an associate lecturer of fashion history and theory and um, i also teach uh, theories of culture my interests are uh, in the Caribbean art history, visual and dress culture. I'm the founder of Instagram platform, Georgian Diaspora Inclusive Histories, um, and it's in a digital humanities project. So just to give you a bit more of a background of myself and Georgian Diaspora, I want you to um, take a look at some of these images that are on the platform. So I would love to go into lots of detail, but I'm just gonna give you a little um, overview of some of these images. So this first image is was painted um, in 1635 um, by um, a female artist and it is depicting Zaga Christ. Now he's an Ethiopian prince and there's a big uh, backstory but um, I'm not going to go into it now, but if you want to see more, go on to Georgian Diaspora, okay, on Instagram, okay. The second image here is of an unknown lady. It's um, painted by Jean Etienne Lyotard in 1742. Um, nobody knows who this lady is. People have speculated, but she was either painted in Turkey, but recently there was a stamp on the back of the actual painting that it was from the Netherlands. And people are speculating that she could be a um, Caribbean woman with the headdress and the style and the way that it's put on her head. So keep that in mind. Um, so down here, um, people might recognize who this is. It's um, Fanny Eaton. She's a pre-Raphaelite model, Jamaican model. This was painted in 1861. Um, and it's a beautiful profile image, just like the others. If you want to know more, look her up. She's very, very interesting. And then this image, which I love, do you want me to go? Beautiful. Um, this, this is a Brazilian portrait um, of an unknown woman. But what I actually love about this image is how she's adorned. That beautiful uh, blue, dark blue, navy um, taffeta or silk that she's wearing dress off the shoulders with like she's strewn in these beautiful gold beads. Um, and this relates to uh, the candoble, which is an Afro-Brazilian religious tradition. And the beads were considered spiritual and an essential component of divine powers of that time. Okay. And then this image. This is Selika Lazavisky. I love it when I've got a name, when I can actually find a name through my arrangement. And she was a brilliant performer, apparently. And there is apparently a film out there, which I haven't been able to find, um, that has recently just come out. And then below her is, if I can just move this down, this, this image here. Okay. That is Harriet Gibbs Marshall. She's got a beautiful coiffed head of hair and she's wearing a black velvet bow. Now I put these images here just to give you a taste of what the kind of research that I do, the visual research that I look to. Um, actually, I didn't finish. So Miss H. Gibbs, um, she was actually a educator, a writer and a musician in Washington Conservatory in 1903. Okay. 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 Okay, so this presentation traces a creative integration and synthesis of dress, fashion and cultural tradi traditions from elements of diverse origins. It will draw on art historical images to reaffirm a Caribbean commonal commonality through textile. So the Caribbean 
um, was the first gateway to the Atlantic, termed the new, termed the new world. Um, the region encompasses a wealth of cultures that have evolved over centuries of complex, turbulent and profound interactions within a geographical area. Among the Ararat Taunos, the indigenous people of the area, Europeans from several countries and peoples from Africa, and some from India and East Asia, the majority being of African descent due to the system of chattel slavery um, from mainly West Africa for over 400 years. So creolization, creolization originally a Caribbean uh, concept describes the mix of different people and cultures. Um, camel break, I'm gonna let out actually. So what are the elements of it encompass all time, all time uh, concept describes the mix of different people and cultures. Um, camel Braithwaite in the development of Creole society in Jamaica um, argues that Britain and, the West, and West Africa, mainly who settled, lived and worked in Jamaica, contributed to the formation of a society which developed its own distinctive character, a process which he termed creolization. So I'm gonna like ask out actually, so what are the elements of creolization? Does anyone have any idea or have thought about it before? Anyone? Anything else? Dress, good, you see, that's what I'm, yep. Cross cultures, exactly. Implanting new ideas around different regions, exactly. Yeah, they're all good. And it does encompass, basically, it does, thanks for your answers, and it does it encompass all time, all types of culture and everything we do. So, and these are just some might pass. Um, but hierarchy is an important one. And art history, we're looking at representation. Okay, so look, so focusing on Madras plan. Now, the reason I focused on Madras is because looking and doing my research um, over the years, I always seem to notice uh, this type of material within imagery that I've seen and that I've been researching. So the first woven yarn, uh, was spun from the tip skin of Madras trees in India. It's now Chennai. Madras, Madras is now called Chennai. The Madras is a pattern that originated in a city in East India, formerly named Madras. Distinguished by a pattern of colorful checks and stripes and the stripes of the Madras check or plaid consist of different colored stripes that cross each other to form overlapping checks. It is a delicate material as it bleeds under harsh washing conditions. Um, Madras check, it's got different names, um, Madras check, plaid, handkerchief check, George cloth, guinea cloth, um, bleeding Madras. And Madras plaid is one of the few fabrics in the world that remains to be handwoven. It was imported to North and West Africa in the 12th century. The Madras cloth was imported to, um, to African territories as early as the 12th century through North African and Middle Eastern traders. The cloth gained significant popularity in North Africa because it was light and comfortable, making it suitable for day-to-day -day activities. The cloth became more popular when taken to West Africa by Portuguese traders from India in the 15th century. By the 17th century, the cloth had become one of the most valuable commodities in trade. Western traders also gave the cloth to the locals in exchange for gold, salt, milk, and other natural resources. By the 18th century, the Madras cloth had made several Portuguese and African traders very wealthy. It was vibrant, it had color and it had a uniqueness and several European and African royalty purchased the fabric. Um, tribes like the Igbo tribe of Nigeria and other small ethnic groups in Ghana, Senegal, 
um, and Cameroon used the cloth for several uh, ceremonies, including weddings. Okay, so later the cloth was imported to England where it was banned from wide, from wide sale by law designed to protect the, the domestic textile industry. Over time, as a slave, as a, as a slave trade took hold, the um, cloth was auctioned off to slave traders who used it to barter for enslaved people in West Africa. Um, and then it was used to clothe them in the Caribbean where it could be legally sold. The fabric soon became a value commodity in the tran transatlantic slave trade well into the 19th century. The British East India Company managed to produce Madras cloth and corner the market for trade. Okay, so it was when um, this is the time in the 18th, in the 18th, early 18th century, um, that Western art began depicting figurative images from Madras. Okay. So, so in this image is a young white woman with a blonde wig reclining in a garden, wearing a simple neoclassical dress with a jawstring neckline and short sleeves. Um, I've added this image as a sitter wears a red and green madras check sash around her waist, leaning on a blue shawl with a striped border, which forms her backdrop. The image also gives a backdrop to a visual study of madras cloth in art history. Okay. Now this is an image, it was taken, it was um, painted by Jean Etienne Laurent in 1795. Okay, so this is when Madras was all the rage. Um, and it was a delicate, um, expensive and usable material, but it was mostly used in the Caribbean. So for somebody like her and her station to use this piece of material, she was almost making a statement, okay? Now, I want everyone to have a look at this image. Can everyone see that? I mean, it's obvious. Can you see where they are, what they're doing? Or... Okay, so this is a market day. Okay. So this is a, um, so this is um, the linen day. Oh, I don't want to say something. Yes, in 1780. So this is an image painted by Augustino Brunaeus. Now he was an Italian man and he was basically sent to the Caribbean islands to kind of, I mean, basically, if you look at this image, it's kind of a romanticized image of what was happening in the Caribbean islands. This is Sunday, people are relaxed, they're selling, but it does make you wonder why he was sent out there, you know, to paint these images where you have an idea that, you know, these are sent back to the European countries, that the Caribbean is a beautiful place and uh, the locals are incredibly happy. You know, so it's important to keep that in mind. Okay, so when you look at these images, you can see even here, the madras that they're wearing. And also the dress that this one is, that this lady is wearing. So that what she's wearing is called a chemise. Okay, so this is Mary Antoinette. And this image that she um, was, this was painted in 1784 and it was scandalous. People didn't like it because they saw her fashioning herself of the Caribbean, of the women of the Caribbean islands because it's quite thin. Um, it's a chemise gown, it's made of muslin um, and lots of sheer textiles. I mean, along with being sheer, it also has um, a whalebone and a stay, which is basically a, a light to corset. 
but this was ridiculed what Mary Antoinette was wearing, but that became one of the main styles of the late um, 18th century. Okay. The most prominent thing that I see is the Madras cloth. Um, and the way they're dressed, it's a traditional um, dress of the African Caribbean women. Um, and it consists of a headpiece, um, a long trail, this, and a petticoat. And also a shawl, which is over the shoulders, and usually some beads. Okay, so give me an idea what when you look at these images, what do you think their station might be? Or what kind of lives they lead? Anyone? Mm. Yeah, maids. I mean, that's how they're depicted, especially this one. Housewife. Okay, a worker, a house cook. Mm hmm Good. But this is the, I mean, I, I want to ask, it's not like a trick question. I'm actually trying to gauge how people think when they see these images, these historical images that are still effective to us today. And I, I, I'm interested in how people see these images and how we can use them um, to change um, how people see things. So it's important. Okay. Yeah, I agree actually, Ellie. She she doesn't look like a maid to me. This this one is pretty obvious because it's called cake and wine and she's got a tray. Okay. But also, yeah. Well, yes, yeah. But uh, yes, I agree with that too. But also when I think of head wraps, I don't know about anybody else, but I know for me and my family. Um, it's a staple, okay? Mm -hmm. And her mannerisms, this is it, because this, she's quite forward looking and she's like going somewhere. She's got something on her mind. That's what it looks like to me. And this this lady here, yeah, she's depicted deliberately um, to look a certain way. So is it that, what I'm trying to glean, I guess, is that, is it that um, Madras cloth is purely seen for people um, in servitude? I mean, I don't necessarily think so, especially through my research, but I do believe that is an, an assumption. Okay. So look at this image, this one, was painted in Paris, in the salons. And I've gone into, I've, I've like zoomed in there. Um, there's another image of her actually with the same lady that she's um, standing next to with the arm in arm. Yes, exactly. Could you because people can be think, oh, maybe she's um in servitude, but you can see she's prominent, quite forward. And what I find interesting is is how her headdress, the madras cloth, is set next to the lady next to her. And both of them look resplendent um walking in Paris. I don't know who she is, but I'm still doing some research on that. As we speak. But if people have any information like this, please, on these images, let me know if I'm interested. Okay, so yes, this, this is an image depicting a Paris salon. The thing that stuck out is her headdress and is beautifully styled. The Caribbean head wrap was part of the cultural dress on the islands, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries. Dress and hair adornment was a way to express individual style in what was essentially a slave society in the islands um, where whether you were enslaved or whether you were a free person of color, which is what was termed back then. A free person of color was someone that was legally free and not enslaved, but you had 
some kind of African ancestry, which was visible. Okay, so now these images, and she could be. I think in these images, a headdress symbolizes more independence, such as the older woman on the right gives a sense of pride, exactly. Beautiful portraits, and I think the design styling of the headdress could also be an indication of status. Okay, exactly. Right, I'm going to go on. So this is uh, the lady on the right, I should have put that up. Lady on the right, um, this was painted in 1829. It's termed as a portrait of a free woman of color wearing a tijon. Now a tijon is basically the French word for a head wrap, okay? And that is um, in, and she's painted in New Orleans. Um, and in New Orleans, they had some tree laws. Um, she's unidentified, but just termed as a free woman of color wearing a tijon. So the Louisiana sumptuary laws in the United States and the Franco Islands, it was a governor Esteban. He um, brought out, he brought out an edict, a law for good government in 1786, and he decreed that the tijon was to be worn uh, by women of color to cover their hair and to refrain from excessive attention to dress. Now. I mean, for a law, for something like that to be brought about um, to cover only women of color's hair, it can only mean that, well, it's to impress and to police uh, black women's bodies. Okay, so the edict was put in place so women of color were required to cover their hair and refrain from excessive attention to dress. Clearly an exercise of power. Um, but as you can see, these women are actually free, both of them. So this woman is uh, a free woman. Is called, this woman, um, she is also a free woman who lived in New York and had to move to um, move from Haiti. And they're both wearing these um, headdresses. So my notes have just gone crazy. And, oh, here, he is. here she is. So her name is Juliette Noel. She's wife of a famous hairdresser, Pierre Toussaint, originally from Haiti, um, living in New York. So these images provide a visual representation of the Madras head wrap, the Tijon, um, a historical and fashionable adornment of black women's dress in the Americas and in the Caribbean. Um, so the sumptuary laws were put in place uh, to subdue black women, but as you can see, the brightly colored head wraps made them stand out um, and have a certain amount of resistance and style and identity, which you saw, um, which some of you commented on there, the way they're standing, the way they're painted, um, you know, their pride in how they look and who they are. But also the sumptuary law didn't stay in too long because after Napoleon sold Louisiana to the Americans, the law was lifted. So I just wanted to add uh, one of the images that I'd um, found in the archive when I was at um, the Maritime Museum. This is it's got no date, but I was, I dated it around 1890s, the, the Regency period, just because of the style of the dress. Can everyone see that? I'll go in a little bit just so they can. I really love this image because I have to be honest, looking um, at the archive of black subjects is what it's termed as uh, when we were doing the project. Um, a lot of the images were quite um, hard to look at, to be honest. And this was one of the better ones. Um, as you can imagine, some of the images were quite brutal and of slavery. And yeah, this, but this image really stood out to me because of the head wrap and what she's wearing. And also this is about writing on the side there, which I 
which we, me and the team were trying to decipher. Um, and the only word that we could get is I something something, and then it says black. So who knows what that says? I don't. I don't think you'll be able to see it on this on this screen. But when you see the real thing, you can actually see it a bit more. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, oh, and that's called, if you wanted to see it, it's called The Lady with the Pineapple and Parasol at the Greenwich Museum, if you wanted to look that up. Okay, so looking at headdresses, I mean, this image is amazing. This is a Guadalupe woman um, from, the, from 1911. So what I've found through my research is actually at the time of um, in the 18th century and early 19th, um, the women in the Francophile islands, um, you know, Guadalupe, Martinique and Haiti, they would actually tie their head wraps in order to send certain messages or to say something about their person and who they are. And I know that this is um, related as well to African um, head wraps as well and how they style theirs. But this is like key to Caribbean women, okay? So one knot, two knots, three knots and four knots, they all have different ideas and different meanings. So one knot means, um, I have a heart for you to take. Um, two knots is my heart is full, but you can try your luck. I mean, I don't know how <laughs> I don't know how true these are, but this is just some of the research I've found. Um, and then three points means I'm a married woman. My heart is definitely bound by marriage, so basically, don't come near me. Um, a four four points means my heart is likely to welcome more lovers. Okay, very interesting because you, you it makes you wonder where does the history come from? Does it come from people that are living in that way, or is it how someone's characterizing? Very interesting. Who knows? Um, yeah, so these are the, the different looks, and then this this image is 1911, which is you know not that far away, not long. But this was taken in Ellis Island, and I just love this image. I think she looks so statuesque. This is a woman traveling to New York, to the Americas, but they had to be checked at the immigration services in Ellis Island. If anybody gets a chance to look at images of Ellis Island in the early 1900s, I suggest you look, you get some great images of her um, people crossing to America. Okay. I've just got a couple more left. Okay. Yes, that's these images. Um, I mean, actually, I've got quite a few images. It's quite hard trying to kind of decide on which images to put into the presentation. But I mean, to me, this these images, when you look... I mean, look at that. I wonder if that's like hair, false hair there. Don't know if anyone can see that well. What can you see? There's beautiful bees that she's got around her neck and the headdress and the hair. But this is such a beautiful image. And you can see that I, I can actually see there are other images actually of how she looks at the back and the front. And you can see that she's got a corset as well, or a stay. <clears throat> and then here you can see, and it makes me wonder has she got two knots that she's wearing there, which means my heart is full, but you can try your luck. Who knows? <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah, so this is so I just wanted to finish up by and this is actually the same woman here, but this has been colorized, modern colorization. 
And also, I wanted to say also I researched into like the different islands and the different colors that they wear, the traditional colors. And they do have different ones like Haiti is blue and white, uh, Guadeloupe is orange and green, Jamaica is red, white, and, gr and, and green. So, I mean, I'm sure there's more islands that they were different with all different colors. So if people know them, just let me know. Because, and I think Barbados is red and same with um, Trinidad. I think it goes, some of them go off the flag, but some of them don't. But it's all really, really, really interesting. It's something I'd like to kind of look into more. So if anybody has any information, um, or also I would really like to like do some more archive research like I was doing at the Royal Maritime Museum, where we were looking into archives, because I think a lot of these institutions aren't sure what to do, because um, they have a lot of images, like loads that they're just sitting on. And I believe that, you know, the way things are going, we should have the right to, um, you know, use them, look at them and teach, you know, our communities um, about these images and that, you know, we didn't just come here in 1948 in Windrush, you know, that we have a long history and be able to um, fashion it and communicate it in our own way. <laughs>